it is your wish. Okay. All right. Uh, the trip by boxcar from Budapest was a fairly lazy trip. Our destination was the uh, city of Sagan, what is now known as Zagan in uh, western Poland. At the time of the war, it was part of German territory, and that's where the prison camp known as Stalag Luft III was located. That's where we ended up. On this tr trip, I uh, got to know a gentleman by the name of Anthony Data, D-A-T-A. -A. He was a Polish officer, a navigator, who was shot down uh, while he was a crew member on a British Royal Air Force bomber that was dropping supplies and ammunition and so on to the Warsaw Underground. And uh, we conversed in Polish. I could speak pretty fluent Polish at the time. And uh, we soon learned that one of the guards could speak Polish too. So we had to cool it. Uh, I later found out that when we arrived at Stalag Luft uh, III, Tony ended up in the cooler. Uh, solitary confinement because he was trying to hide something in the water closet, in the toilet, and he slipped and he grabbed a hold of his water closet <laughs> and tore the whole damn thing down and made a big mess, you know. So his punishment, they put him in the cooler for a while. The reason I bring his name up is because quite a few years later, uh, specifically about 1958-59, uh, my wife and, my, and myself uh, and two children ended up in England on a special assignment and Tony happened to be working and living in Oxford, England. He was now a tailor and so I thought it was wonderful that we could renew our friendship. He was very adamant about trying to come to the United States, but I don't know if he ever did. I didn't think so. Now, as far as uh, Stalag Luft three is concerned, I spent roughly eight months in the Stalag. Well, maybe less than eight, maybe six or seven months. But rather than go into a lot of detail that is currently a matter of record, this book right here, The Secret Story of Stalag Luft Three, by Durand, is an excellent history of all of the incidents surrounding the camp, how it was built, how it was run, uh, goes into quite a bit of detail about the Great Escape, which uh, 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 which was used as a the basis for a very excellent movie. It was uh, played. Uh, let's see, Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen. Yes, Steve McQueen and uh, Gardner are playing key roles, and. Uh, Another book written by a gentleman called Sage. I have a copy of that book too. Sage was a, a agent of a, one of our secret organizations, and uh, he is used as a as a basis for one of the characters in the movie. Uh, they known as the Cooler King, because he kept trying to escape, always recaptured. And, uh, now, I'm going to skip most of the details, 
of what prison life was like in Stago Street, because it's all recorded in this book. Let me ask you though, Mitch, um, what were the living conditions like? I mean, did you each have your own area to sleep or...? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll describe that. So, well, there is an incident too that I, I want to mention. When we first arrived at Stago Street, there were no spaces for us in the barracks. Uh, each barracks had probably 14 rooms. Each room was occupied by, say, seven prisoners, and they slept in double-decker bunks. Very basic, with uh, boards, and on the boards, straw-filled palliasse, which is a, a mattress. Now, when we arrived, and the term they used for a new batch of prisoners coming in was purge. The purge is in. We first had to stay in tents because there was no room for us in the barracks. Eventually they did some study of the matter and they decided that all the double bunks were going to become triple bunks. So instead of uh, seven men in a room, there was going to be 14 men in a room. And I, was, I knew a couple of people in there that when I came in, they came to me and said, hey, we've been waiting for you. <laughs> Glad to see you. So you were mixed with British POWs and, and, and Americans? Yeah, they were, they, we were all Americans in this particular compound. Okay. Now, Stalagluft 3 had four compounds. And at first there was a mixture. And uh, the great escape, the, the digging of the tunnels was done by both uh, British, Allied, and American POWs. But before the escape actually took place, the Germans moved all the prisoners from the north compound into the south compound. I was in the south compound. So it just so happened that when the escape finally was triggered, all the prisoners who went through the tunnel and tried to make that escape were either British or British Allied, Allied like Poles, uh, Dutch, and so on. No. Uh, it's made pretty clear here. Another book that was written, written by uh, one of the people who made the escape. There are three people out of over a hundred who went through that tunnel. Actually <coughs> made it. Actually... <coughs> succeeded in escaping. I think Mary's here. Uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, so the three guys escaped, actually got all the way free. The three out of the whole bunch actually made it. One of these guys was a Dutchman. Van der Stuck. He wrote a book named War Pilot of Orange. Uh, his escape was very... Uh, Van der Stuck, of course, could speak German. It was one of the reasons he was successful in making the escape. He, uh, after the war, was given command of a Spitfire squadron and uh, they wanted to give him a job, uh, a key position in the KLM Airlines. How about doing something about that dog? Uh, but he refused. He wanted to be a, a medical doctor. So he went to school and became a medical doctor moved to the United States, eventually to Hawaii, delivered hundreds of babies. And uh, that was his, that was his, uh, his history. Of those that escaped, uh, and, and they're 
their trials and tribulations are well documented in this movie, The Great Escape. Uh, Fifty of the people who were recaptured were murdered by the Gestapo. Was that as an example or? It was on Hitler's order. He wanted them all killed, but somehow or other there was a screw up in the, in the way the orders were followed and only 50 were killed. Uh, the uh, commanding officer of Stalag Luft III, who was a member of the old Prussian school, proud German officer who obviously didn't go along with some of the radical practices of the Hitler's uh, Gestapo and so on. He was very upset by the fact that so many of the prisoners that were recaptured were murdered. And he called a uh, senior British officer in to tell him about it. He said, I'm sorry to tell you that 50 of the prisoners who made the escape through that tunnel were killed. Sorry about that. And the British officer said, thank you for telling me. Would you t please answer me one question? How many were wounded? <laughs> well, the, the cat was out of the bag right there. He had to admit they were not killed escaping, they were murdered. And incidentally, after the war, the pe people responsible for doing the killing were tried and, and convicted. Now this happened in the North Compound, right? Well, the North Compound was where the escape... Yeah. And you were in the South Compound? I was in the South Compound. Did you guys know that this was happening yeah, before, we knew that before they were the escape? Killed. No, I mean, did you, were you aware that this escape plan was in progress? No, no. I, I, arrived, I arrived at the camp uh, a couple of months after that incident. Oh, okay. But I'd heard all, heard all about it. I was told that the Germans had put out, in fact, I was given a copy of the German pronouncement saying, escape is no longer a, 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 a game. It's serious business. You've got to stop this nonsense. Cool it. it was generally believed by all that the duty of an officer was to constantly try to escape. Right. That was a duty. And they were encouraged to try to do that. Of course, this put a burden on the, on the capturing power. They had to maintain strict control. Now, there things that are not mentioned in the book, there are a couple of things that I can talk about that might be of some interest. Uh, in January of 45, as the Russian front drew closer and closer, it was pretty obvious that the, the Russian army was going to overrun this camp and many other camps that were in Poland. Now Hitler gave the order to evacuate these camps and move the prisoners westward and re-incarcerate them in existing camps further inland. So in the latter part of January 1945, about 8 o'clock at night, it was snowing outside, cold. It was about the coldest winter in Central Europe in a long time. The order came into our barracks. Be ready to move in two hours. We're going to march. Now we had two hours to prepare ourselves for a journey, which came to be known as the March. And we marched for about 
three days, four days, total about 60 miles or so, from Sagan, from, the, from our prison camp to the city of Spremberg. Now, to get ready for the march, I took a shirt and I sewed the sleeves of the shirt to the side of the shirt and I sewed the bottom of the, of the shirt so I, what I had was a huge backpack. I could put my arms through the loops and on the back was what, what I wanted to carry with me. It was clothing. I don't know what else I had. I had a, a book that I had maintained called The Wartime Log with pictures and uh, poems and information, that kind. Of, I had that with me. Did you still have your money? What? Your money? Did you still have the money? The money? Oh, the money. Yeah, the strange thing about the money is when we got to Stalag of Three, we had to take all our clothing and turn it in for delousing. Uh, live steam, and I was wondering if I was get my own clothing back because that's where the money was. So when I came into the camp and I was interviewed by uh, Big X, Big X was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Clark, who later became a general officer and head of the Air Force Academy. Uh, all new prisoners coming in were interviewed to find out how they got shut down and to report anything they saw along the way that might be of interest. And of course they were concerned about uh, imposters, Germans, sneaking into the camp as, as American prisoners. We had very tight control in the camp to make sure that we knew who the hell was in there at all times. We had the ability to get British broadcasting newscast every day, BBC. Uh, we even had a capability to make transmissions. The Germans could never find the, the equipment. What about taking pictures? They even had a clandestine camera. They had a clandestine camera and they took some pictures during the march. I've got a report on that with pictures taken of the march. I'm going to tell you a story about something that happened on the march. Number one, it was cold as hell. And you would walk along and your feet would perspire and then you got tired so they paused. The whole troop would, would pause for a rest and your feet would freeze. And you'd come over a hill and you'd look back and you would see a column of prisoners, three, three, a column of threes, just as far as you could see. It kind of reminds you of pictures of these ants. You know, when ants come into your house, they all seem to follow one another, and you see a whole string of them going up into your attic. Well, that's what, you, what it looked like. It was a miserable sight. And of course, the German guards who had to come along with us, they were miserable as well. And the question was, why didn't you try to escape during, the, during this period? And it, the answer was, where to? I mean, everywhere you looked were snow-covered fields in the middle of the boonies. You know, you were out in the open country. There was no place to escape. And some guys, you know, fell by the wayside and didn't make it. Uh, one farm place that we stopped in, full farm, uh, for a rest. Uh, as, as I was getting ready to go into the hay barn to take a little rest, I noticed there were two young people working. Uh, had a wheelbarrow and shovel and stuff, they were busy. And they were about, I'd say, 15 or 16 years old. And just for the hell of it, I decided I'd, uh, I spoke to them in Polish. 
And when I did, they lit up and rushed to me and <laughs> proceeded to talk as rapidly as they could. They were Poles and they were slave laborers on this farm. And the first thing they wanted to tell me about was something I didn't know anything about. And that was the death camps, the gas chambers, the crematoriums. They were telling me details I didn't know about. And when they got through, I made sure to report all this to the senior American officer. I figured somebody's got to know this. But these poor kids were scared to death. They told me that the German farmer threatened to kill them. If the Russians came, he was going to kill them. That's what they told me. And they were really scared. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what can I possibly say to them that would give them some hope? Uh, so I told them, I said, look, next time a German farmer is talking to you like that, he's going to know we were here. But you remind him that we are American officers and that we know you are here. We know you're here. If anything happens to you, he's going to get it. He's going to be punished. And when I told them that, they lit up and smiled. And when we left, they waved. They were relatively happy. I felt, well, what could I say to them? Yeah. That's the only thing I could think of. Uh, we got to Spremberg. There we had to get in boxcars again. And the European boxcars are smaller than ours. They're designed for 40 men or eight horses. They packed them with 50 prisoners. And the boxcars were obviously had been previously used for transporting cattle or horses or something. They smelled pretty bad. I got as close to the edge of the end of the boxcar as possible. I got in quickly and I moved so I was right up against the wall. The cars were so crowded that we couldn't all sit down at the same time. Some people had to stand. So I got next to the wall because I wanted to take my jackknife out and use it on that wall. I was going to make myself a peephole. I wanted to know where we were going. And one of the things that troubled me was being taken someplace by the enemy and not knowing where we were going. I wanted to know where we were going. So I took this jacket and I began working on that wall. And during the next 24, 48 hours in that boxcar, I ended up making a hole about three inches in diameter in the side of the boxcar. And the boxcar was about an inch and a half to two inches thick. Yeah. So it was a, quite a task. But that's a, another place where my knife came in, in the picture. And I kept track of the cities that we passed through because they always had these signs on the passenger stations and along the tracks of what the name of the town was. Now the boxcars, what do I remember about the boxcars? Well, there was one thing, thing I remember. We stopped one time and uh, on a curve and they allowed the prisoners to leave the boxcar for uh, for BM. 
And the thing that I remember, and I wish that I had a camera to record it, was as you looked on this curve, you could see probably 25 to 30 boxcars. And all the inmates from the boxcars were all on the side of this embankment. And they were all elbow to elbow mooning the countryside. And it, and it was kind of a dark day. And the contrast of these white behinds and this dark day all together mooning the sun. I thought that was such a comical view. <laughs> if I'd have had a camera, I'd have got a picture that would have been worth a thousand dollars. Another time we stopped was to get some something to eat. And I asked for volunteers who, to come and help bring the food to the boxcars. Well, I volunteered and we went along the track and down the embankment and there were two or three huge, uh, how the hell you call them, like barrels, well barrels, full of soup. And underneath that was, they had a fire going. And there were a couple of women tending to that. So the engineer knew that that was a place where they were going to stop to get food and that the women obviously knew they were going to be providing food for this train. And so they were there with the, with the soup. And we had containers, and we were going to take that back to the boxcar. Now one of the women could speak English. And she said to me, why do you Americans have to join this war? Why did you have to come into the war? <laughs> In effect, implying we were doing pretty damn good until you came along. <laughs> well, you know, in a situation like that, you don't argue too much. I had one incident in which I did argue with a German guard. Uh, he was a sergeant, could speak English, and uh, I decided I would get in an argument with him about politics. I said, I've heard about, you know, I read and all this about the Nazis and what their beliefs were and so on. And well, I said, here's a, a real John Doe Nazi. I want to see firsthand what the hell's going through their brain. And so I got involved in a debate with him. Well, it started out as a debate, but it ended up with him sounding a little bit like Adolf. He was really uptight, and the other American prisoners said to me, would you please lay off of this guy? He's got a gun, and if you don't lay off him, he's going to use it. So I, I said, okay, I, I quit arguing with him. He would use such phrases as uh, Rosenfeld when referring to our president, Rosenfeld, which of course is a, is a slight variation on the name so that it sounds Jewish, part of their propaganda routine. Well, the train eventually arrived at Moosburg, which is a town right next to this new prison camp we were going to get go into. Not new, but it's a different one. It was called Stalag 7A. It already had about 10,000 prisoners in it. Mm -hmm. And so in came our big crowd of prisoners really made it overcrowded. Uh, now this was about February, so we stayed in this place until we were liberated on the 29th of April, 1945. We were liberated by General Patton's 3rd Army, the 14th Armored Division. And the day that we were liberated, General Patton himself visited the camp. And the reason he did was, uh, the word was that his son-in-law was there. Patton made an attempt to rescue his son-in-law some months earlier uh, at another location, and the, and the attempt failed miserably. But so, 
he found out that his son-in-law was here with, in our camp. And so he visited and arrived in his fancy jeep with his shiny helmet and fancy pistols and all. And of course, all the prisoners gathered around with all to look at the big the general. I was in the hospital at the time of that liberation. But as soon as they, it became obvious that the camp had been liberated, because an American tank had just barged through the front gate and was in the camp itself with hundreds of prisoners surrounding it, I got out of my bunk, went outside, made a hole in the fence, and I ran across an open field about oh, 300 yards to a group of buildings where I knew the German guards were quartered. That was their barracks. And I was hunting for food and some souvenirs. But I felt... Well, the end of the, this was for for us the end of the war, liberation, and it was so wonderful, so wonderful to feel free again. I couldn't keep from being so exuberant that I got the hell out of there. I went through the fence, crossed this field, this German guard barracks looking for some food and souvenirs. I came to the first barracks. I opened the door, walked into the first room, and in this room was a bunk, a wall closet, and a chair on which was sitting a German guard. He was smoking a cigarette, and he was pretty nervous. Obviously, he was waiting to be taken prisoner and worried that he might get killed in the process. And so I ignored him, and I start going to his wall locker. And uh, I found some food and, and a souvenir. The food was a 10-pound block of cheese. <laughs> which he got from a nearby cheese factory, obviously, and uh, his uh, uniform hat, uh, dress hat, which I still have, by the way. It's in my office. And uh, as soon as I got that, I left him and I went back across the field, back through the fence, into the ward, into the hospital ward, and shared the cheese with the other prisoners. And uh, that was the beginning of a whole new adventure. Mitch, let me ask you. So when the Germans realized that, you know, the, uh, you know, they were going to be, you guys were going to be liberated, mm -hmm. uh, how long did, was it between when they left and uh, the liberation happened? Well, this is something that's hard for me to answer because uh, you have to remember a lot of things were happening one after the other very quickly. The first thing that happened was uh, the security of the area to make sure that all the armed resistance had ceased. The American troops wanted to make sure there was no chance of a fanatic of some kind still with a weapon in his hands uh, killing one of our troops. So they had to be careful. Uh, in fact, there were a number of SS surrounding the camp that were refused to give up, and they they fired at their own guards and wounded a couple of them. I understand. So, and from that moment on, there was a period of uh, I had to explain this. It's a period of no law and order, no control, nothing a blank, a vacuum. The area is liberated, but 
it was loose. Yeah. It was a loose area. And I'll explain in a little while another example of that uh, very shortly. Because because I was in the hospital, I was one of the first to evacu evacuate it. All the hospital people got put in GI trucks and we were driven from Mooseburg, from Stalag 7A, to uh, the vicinity of the city of Regensburg. Regensburg had been one of our very dangerous targets because there was a Messerschmitt aircraft assembly plant there nearby. So we knew Regensburg very well, but that's where the trucks took us. And they unloaded us and told us to wait because transports, C-47 transports were going to arrive to pick us up and transport us to Paris. So at the moment there was nothing there. Uh, there was a, the only thing standing where they dropped us off was an old mess hall. The rest of the plant was absolute shambles, totally, totally destroyed by our demolition bombs. Uh, there was only one other thing standing, was an uh, air raid shelter, it looked like an upside down ice cream cone made of reinforced concrete, about three stories. We went through that, didn't find anything there worth taking. And so we start walking towards town, the sergeant and I, he had a cast around his neck. As we approached the outskirts of the city, we ran into a, a three or four ladies who were busy shoveling paraphernalia, military paraphernalia and items into a bomb crater right in the middle of the intersection there. And they were getting ready to bury it. All kinds of things. Daggers, swords, uniforms. I confiscated a sword, a Nazi sword, and uh, we then went to the nearest house and knocked on the, the door a lady came out and we asked her if we could spend some time getting some sleep there because we were very, very sleepy. And she said, well, we have some Allied troops here already, but I think we can find room for two more. So she allowed us in. She took our names on a yellow pad and we, we went into the house and there were about four or five other uh, allied troops in there. Uh, she proceeded to make some hot coffee for us using the Nescafe that I had. And then uh, while we were there, there was a big commotion. A young German girl came dashing into the house, very excited and talking rapidly in German. And the lady of the house told us, that she was very concerned because down the street where she lived, uh, a Russian uh, liberated prisoner was poking around and they were worried that he might do something terrible to them. And so they wanted to get the hell out of there. As history shows, there was a lot of uh, activity on the part of Russian soldiers, prisoners and non-prisoners, uh, taking retribution by being extremely brutal to the German population, especially the women. But I said, I've just got to get something, a place to sleep. So the, uh, the lady of the house showed me a couch I lay down on the couch and she covered me with a one of these feather-filled uh, comforters, soft and warm, and I must have been asleep in about 30 seconds. It didn't seem like any time at all when I was being awakened and told that the planes were coming. 
And so we thanked the lady and left and returned to the aircraft assembly plant that had been bombed. And in, in nearby airfield, there were C-47s, twin engine transport aircraft landing. And soon thereafter, we were aboard and on our way to Paris. When we arrived in Paris and got out of the, as we left the aircraft, there were about, oh, 12 to 14 French soldiers uh, forming a corridor for us. They had their rifles at present arms, and it was sort of a uh, guard of honor as we left the plane. And the first place they directed us was to the mess hall to, to get something to eat. Arrived in the mess hall, and they had finished their, their lunch for the day, but we got a tray and walked down the hallway to get some food. Uh, one of the doorways was, I stopped because there was a, a big uh, uh, pail, big, huge, 40, 60 gallon pail of food. So I stopped to get some food. I was told, no, that's the garbage. You go in and get some food. <laughs> so I did, I went and got some food, and then after that we were, went to a, a room for processing. And <coughs> what is, are they aware? Yeah. Okay. So we, there was about 14 of us in this room being processed. That means they were taking our names and getting ready to... No let us in as, as patients. This is an army hospital. Right. I'm in the back of the crowd, and I'm, again, so sleepy I can hardly stand up. I look around, and I notice that the floor in that room was spotless, so clean. I couldn't resist it. I immediately got down under the table and lay down and fell asleep. And when they got through processing everybody, they found out they were one short. They looked around and it was me. I was under the <laughs> table sleeping. So they woke me up, they processed me, and then they took me in to a, uh, a bathroom with a huge European style bathtub. Very deep, you could get drowned if you slipped. And it was full of hot water. And I got my first hot bath since I left America. It was so wonderful. I can't tell you. How long were you kept uh, prisoner? Well, I like to tell people it was over eight months, but I like to say it's uh, eight months, one week, one day, and two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, after the, after the bath, and clean clothing, uh, pajamas, and they took me into a place to get some sleep. It was a bunk and it had white sheets on it. I couldn't believe my eyes. White sheets. I said, wow. I was about ready to lay down to go to sleep and a nurse walked by. And she was wearing the most wonderful perfume. In the background, I could hear there was a radio playing, uh, it was playing classical music. And this combination of clean sheets, hot baths, music, and that perfume, I felt I was... <laughs> oh boy, I can't think of it. <laughs> it was so wonderful. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. It was freedom. People that don't know what freedom means. That was freedom. Right. How long were you kept at the respite center? About two days. Okay. And then, and then they flew me to 
to the UK and uh, another hospital in the UK. And I remember there was some German prisoners working in the hospital. Uh, and shortly after we got there, the war in Europe was over. V.E. Day. I understand that the celebration in uh, London was phenomenal. I missed all of that. I never saw one bit of it. Because you were in the hospital? I was in the hospital. Yeah. And uh, all we had was a couple of doctors invited a, a couple of us up to their office to have a drink, which we did. And uh, that was that. A few days later, I was in London waiting for a ship. Now, the next month and a half was very critical in a way. Mitch, let me ask you real quick. What was your weight when you finally... That was my what? Your weight. How much did you weigh when you were at the... Oh, uh, I imagine about 120. Okay. Uh, my normal weight was uh, about 130, 135. Oh, okay. Uh, I was hungry all the time, but uh, getting to London, I'm going to make this story very short, but it's very important. Uh, while I'm waiting to go home to the States, I make friends with a very pretty young lady in London, and we saw a lot of each other. And point that I, I thought I wanted to get married. And we both agreed to get married. And uh, I, uh, I bought a ring. I saw the chaplain, according to rules, getting ready to get married. And then one day I I'm in my room alone and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, uh, I wonder if I'm doing the right thing. Am I doing the right thing? I need some guidance. So I remembered my experience in that solitary cell where I was helped by a very important person. And so I knelt down and I prayed, asking for guidance. What should I do? Am I doing the right thing? Well, apparently the very act of asking gave me the answer. No, I wasn't doing the right thing. I should go home first. Yeah. That's I came to that conclusion. And I in order to ease the transition for the young lady, I, I typed up some orders that looked very <laughs> official to show that I was leaving um, very shortly by ship to the States. And I told her I was, I'd come back and I would get her. And I really thought I would. I thought, if this is the right thing, I will come back. Right. If it's not the right thing, I won't. It's that simple. And so I eventually got on the ship, heading back to the States, and on the ship I became friends with a young man who was also a POW. He was a P-47 pilot from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And after our 70-day leave of absence, we both were assigned to the same base in San Antonio, Texas. And one day he asked me, would you like to come to Tulsa with me and be my best man? I'm getting married. I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. So I went with him to Tulsa, Oklahoma to be his best man. And uh, 
the maid of honor turned out to be my wife. Yeah. My future wife. I didn't marry her until about a year later, but I met her at that wedding in a church. You couldn't ask for a better situation. And I was very impressed with her, but I didn't see her again for another year. And when I finally saw her, I was attending a, a school, a special school in Denver, Colorado. Uh, her phone number was given to me by my friend, who I was the best man for. He said, you might call her. I called her. And from then on, I didn't give her any peace. I was <laughs> on her case like a hawk. I did everything I could to convince her that we should get married. I, I, I felt this was the right thing. And I kept trying. Finally she said, I'm going to go home for Christmas. Would you like to come with me and meet my parents? I said, yes. And while we're there, let's get married. Because if we don't get married now, who knows, we may be in Timbuktu. And you want your parents to be at the wedding, right? Yes, she said. Okay, so she agreed. And we got married on Christmas Day. Mm. And got married in the living room of the family farmhouse. And who was best man in Matron of Honor? The people we stood up for. <laughs> it was a wonderful time. Now, at this time, Mitch, were you still in the service? Yes, I'm still in the service. So when you came back from Paris, um, how long did you spend, you know, in the hospital before they put you back to active duty? Well, I was, theoretically, I was on active duty as soon as they released me from the hospital in Wales. I was just waiting for transportation back to the States. And my initial status was on leave. They gave me seven day, 70 days of leave after returning home. And that's how come I then met Jack Eastman again after we was finished with the leave and then he asked me to come up to Tulsa to be his best man. Did they give you an option of getting out of the service? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And I you decided to stay? I, well, I could have gotten out. But I wanted to stay in. I wanted to make the Air Force my career. It just so happened that the Air Force was loaded with second lieutenants uh, who had been trained to fly bombers and fighters and all that stuff. And they, they didn't want them all. So they were releasing them left and right. So I just got through attending this course in Lowry Field, aerial photography course. And I'm being given an ultimatum for all practical purposes. Uh, you know, you either got to get out, or if you want to stay in, we'll take you in as a master sergeant. You can re-enlist as a master sergeant. It's a pretty high rank for re-enlistment. Well, it, yeah, it's, it was essentially then at that time the highest, yeah, highest rank you could be. And I, so I said to myself, well, I just, I just got married. Remember, I'm, yeah. I talked to, to my wife about it, and I, I said, well, I, th I think I'm going to stay in because from the way things look in the world, it won't be long before they recall me anyhow. So uh, I got out and I re-enlisted in a, a field near Newburgh, New York, because it was the closest Air Force installation to my home state of Connecticut. Uh, this field was also known as the uh, West Point of the Year because it was right next to the U.S. Army Academy, uh, Military Academy. So we stayed there about a year and a half and during that period I was asked by the base chaplain if I would like to be his assistant. So I said, certainly, I could be glad to do that. So I became his assistant, and one of the tasks besides the usual preparing the chapel for Sunday services 
uh, he and I traveled around the country visiting uh, next of kin of uh, people who had been killed during the war uh, or died thereafter shortly. And uh, he would provide the uh, type of service as you would expect from a chaplain. I would in turn take necessary information from the people to make sure I had all the data to then write letters to the proper government offices to get their insurance money and everything else that was due to them. And so we spent a lot of time talking uh, in the car. There was no radio in the car at the time. But we spent a lot of time on the road and I became very close friends with uh, Chaplain Harold T. Whitlock, Methodist minister. And he then got recalled to active duty, as I predicted. So I'm going to go through the next period of explaining what happened. As soon as he got recalled to active duty, I came back in as a second lieutenant, I think. And my first assignment was Shepherd Air Force Base, Wichita Falls, Texas. So my new my new wife and I traveled to Wichita Falls, Texas. What year is this? What, what year is this? That you, what? what year? Oh, that was 1948. Okay. 1948, and uh, I'm back on active duty now as a first lieutenant, and I'm given a job of uh, personnel services officer at a base which is essentially an Air Force boot camp. Thousands of recruits, all restricted to the base for 13 weeks. And my job was to keep them relatively happy during that 13-week period because they couldn't go anywhere. So I organized, my staff and I organized different activities that would be recreational in nature. And uh, it was uh, well done. And uh, the commanding officer of the base was a one-star general called me in one day and he said, I've got a problem because the officers club is well tended and a lot of membership, but the non-commissioned officers club is a disaster. It's not being run right. It's got membership is way down. He said, I want you to fix the problem and I don't care how you do it. Goodbye. I saluted and said, that's the way to go. I like that kind of order. I then proceeded to read the regulations on the subject to find out what I could do and what couldn't I couldn't do. I got a new uh, group of people to come in and be uh, uh, advisory staff at the club. I saw to it that the old group got fired. I resisted the uh, endeavor of a slot machine operator to get cozy. and uh, But the next job was, how do we get the membership up? Oh, the sergeant that worked for me, his name was Jimmy Bannister, had some experience with nightclubs. He said, we're going to put on a show and we're going to get the word out that it's going to be a real good show. and it, But to see it, you're going to have to be a member. So we got the word out. Jimmy went to Dallas and contracted with a burlesque dancing group. And a small band brought him to the base. And we got the word out that it was going to be a red-hot show and what the requirements were to go see it. In fact, the word got out so well that 
there were certain officers that were bribing enlisted men to use their ID cards so they could go see the show. <laughs> what it involved was a band on a stage playing rock and roll music, and the young ladies would come out and dance around the group. The group, we had all the guys, oh, by the way, membership was up about 90%. <laughs> The whole group was sitting on the floor, they had to sit down. And the young ladies would come out and then dance around this group. And, uh, and then they would head back into the ladies' room. And there we had a man waiting with a towel, throw the towel on him, and guard the door to make sure that nobody followed him. Anyhow, the upshot was, it was a very successful evening, and I was glad that the job was well done. The general, was glad too. He called me in. He said, you did a good job. What can I do for you? Well, I said, I'd love to be transferred to uh, Lowry Air Force Base, Denver, Colorado. He said, okay, we'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I got to go to Denver again. And, but we weren't there very long before I got orders to go to Japan. Mm. And my wife was pregnant and due to deliver about that time. So I had to get an extension, my departure, so I could be there for the arrival of my first child. Anyhow, to shorten things up, I got to Japan, I got assigned to an organization that I thought would be a good one to be with, called the Sixth Photo Technical Squadron, later renamed the 548th Reconnaissance Technical Squadron. And about five months later, my wife arrived with child. And I was at the, at the dock in Yokohama to greet her. And to make a long story short, we ended up spending a little time at a hotel up on the mountain near Mount Fuji, and then eventually got a place to live on the base, uh, what the British would call married quarters. Uh, and then we, we had two maids, uh, two Japanese maids that were paid for by the Japanese government as part of wartime reparations. One's named Sumiko, the other was named Kuko. They were very nice young girls and they did a terrific job. And when we returned home, uh, oh, one of the incidents was kind of, kind of funny in a way. Kuko was getting ready to get married, but her husband to be was just dying to find out what kind of environment his wife to be was working in. Remember, this is only a few months after the war. Right. So Kuko asked us if we would mind if she invited her husband to come and visit there for a short visit. He said, certainly, please do, please ask him. So when he arrived, we showed him due hospitality and courtesy and all that, and apparently uh, made a decent impression on him because when we returned to the States, they continued to write to us and sent pictures of their baby and that kind of stuff. How long were you in Japan? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. While I was there, the Korean War broke out. And I've compiled a record, historical record of some of the air cam, air targets, the bombings and so on. And I, I want to converse with you about that and possibility. That's something that could be donated to the right. library. Yeah. Uh, because it's a one of a kind thing. And the original negatives for all these things are, Lord, long knows where they're gone to. So everybody that sees the thing is impressed with it, you know. Okay. So back from Japan, my first assignment is uh, to be in charge of a photographic laboratory, motion picture laboratory in Burbank, California. We had a bunch of cameramen, Air Force cameramen, that were out taking movies of the nuclear bomb tests in the Pacific. 
and we would process all the film. But I wanted to be involved with aerial photography, so I did a bit of badgering and eventually got a transfer, got a transfer to the Pentagon. So I arrived at the Pentagon to take over the duties of a chief of the library branch of the Photographic Records and Services Division, which was a division of the Aeronautical Chart and Information Service. Their job was to take care of all the photography, aerial photography, worldwide. There were tons of it. Well, I was doing this job for about a year and a half when I decided what I wanted to do is get involved with something really important, and that is photographic interpretation, the specialty. So I applied for that school, was uh, approved, and back to Denver we go to attend the, the it was known as the Air Intelligence, Air, see, the name of it. Photo, rad, Photo Radar Interpretation School. Six months, I think, was the course. Level. And uh, after I got through with that, they uh, kept me as an instructor. And as an instructor, I ended up spending the rest of the time. The school was open in Denver, and then they moved the school where? Wichita Falls, Texas, Shepard Air Force Base. So there I am back in Texas, and now I'm put in charge of the photo intelligence course. I did that for about a year and a half. So did, did you ever develop film that showed something that you had no idea what it was? That did what? That you didn't know what it was. Oh yeah. Because the late 40s was real oh, big yeah, for Simon, UFOs. The assignment was a chaplain. I never got trained for that. <laughs> uh, my assignment at Shepherd Air Force Base as personnel services officer. I never got any training for that. But you see, at the time, the thinking was this. It, the Germans had the same philosophy. If you're an officer, you're supposed to be able to do anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, you either swam or you sank. You were given a t job and, you know, you just you had, to, you had to be innovative and learn new tricks. And but the most important thing you had to have, you had to know how to deal with people. That was essential. Uh, while I was with the chaplain, uh, with the, working for the chaplain, and something happened that I don't know to this day if the powers that be knew about it at all. But in any case, shortly thereafter I got recalled to active duty. But what happened? I was in the theater, the base theater, watching a one of these Air Force documentary films about the war. Its purpose was, of course, to build enthusiasm and esprit de corps, blah, blah, and all that. And this captain, I don't even remember his name, he gave a little talk after the, the film was over with and he started walking out. And as he was walking out, a large number of these GIs that were in there were vocal about and sarcastic about the whole operation. It was disgraceful. I was so incensed that I got up and I yelled at the top of my voice for everybody to stop where they're going and sit down immediately. And they did. And then I gave them a tongue lashing. Said, okay, you're now excused. Uh, I, I never heard about that from it, except one a GI came to me once, and he said, "How 
how happy he was of what I did, and that he was, he wanted to thank me. So for all I know, somebody, there's no saying, nothing happens on a base that the commander didn't find out about one time, one way or another, so you know, it could have been that way. Yeah. But anyhow, so now I'm going back to Denver to school. I, I learned to be a, becoming a photographic interpreter, and I'm made to be chief of the school. Went back down, the school is moved back to Shepherd Air Force Base. After about a year and a half of being a supervisor of this photo interpretation school, I get the opportunity to have a choice. I can either be assigned to the University of Chicago to get a bachelor's degree, or I could take an assignment with the Royal Air Force in England as an exchange officer. Well, an exchange officer is one who is moved from the parent unit to a foreign government, and they in turn move a person of similar rank to, you know, as a replacement or exchange. So the British and the United States were doing that extensively. So I went, I went to England with my wife and two children now, and I am, my job is to be an instructor in the British Photo Interpretation School, joint school. They taught people from every branch of the service, plus foreigners. And I'm promoted to major while I'm there. And another child is born. And she's still with me today. She lives in Carlsbad. She's probably sitting right here someplace. And what year was that? Uh, 19, let's see. We went to England in 19, in December of 1957. And we were there in 58, 59, and returned home in 1960. And on the return to the United States, after two and a half years in England, uh, which I must add was a very pleasant assignment. I made many good friends that I still correspond with. And uh, I'm glad I made the decision to go there instead of go to Chicago. Yeah. As it turned out, I, I took a number of university classes anyhow, and through extension courses later on. But I selected England to be an exchange officer, so there we go, we were there two and a half years, come back, assigned to Shore Air Force Base, South Carolina, to the 363rd Tactical Reconnaissance Wing, and I am assigned as the Staff Intelligence Officer for the Wing. And while there, I I write a critique of uh, a study that was done by a U.S. Army Research Office. Uh, the Personnel Research Office, which was part of the U.S. Army Research and Development Command. So they put out a paper on the subject that uh, I knew a little bit about, and uh, their whole study was flawed in many respects, and I proceeded to write a uh, critique of it, which happened to come into the hands of the chief of the army unit that was responsible for putting it out. And I think they said, let's get that guy aboard before he gets causes more damage. And so they came and wanted to hire me. Uh, by they, I mean they sent they sent a representative. All while this is happening, I'm being uh, talked to by some people who are members of the Central Intelligence Agency. 
and a proceed to convince me that what I should do as soon as I get out of the Air Force is to join the CIA. I said, well, that sounds like a good suggestion because if I'm going to be doing anything, I want to be on the first team. And what, what, what I was interested in was getting a job with the agency as, as a photographic interpreter. Right. Now, what, what year is this that you're... Now, this is uh, 1962. Oh, okay. 62. Uh, and the thing is, I'm now back in the States, getting ready to retire, and I've got a job. They agreed to take me, but the CIA wanted me to to come work for them, but I had to get a background investigation. Right. So I, I, and that could take quite a few months. So I took the army job. They, uh, they gave me a position in that very office that had generated that dumb report. And they hired me, I think, at a, a GS-12, which is a pretty it's high, rank, yeah. pretty high grade to start. See. Meanwhile, the background investigation is going, and in uh, late 1962, shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, my investigation was completed. I took a polygraph test. I went through interviews and blah, 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 and all that stuff. And I qualified. They uh, they hired me. So I went to work about oh, February or March of 1963. Yeah, I think 63. So I got there after the Cuban Missile Crisis. But I got in on the ground floor of some exciting developments. What I'm going to tell you now is public knowledge, and so I don't have to worry about submitting it for right. approval. So uh, there are certain things if I were to say talk to you about, I might have to get approval. Right. But in any case, I reported to the office of the national. Photographic Interpretation Center, which was under the domain of the Central Intelligence Agency. And 50% uh, of the directing staff of all the branches and divisions came from the Defense Intelligence Agency. The rest were from the Central Intelligence Agency. Except the interpreters that were hired were whoever they could find. They, they needed interpreters bad. Why? Because there was a big explosion in demand for intelligence on the Soviet Union. Uh, I've got a book laying here someplace on the table there. Uh, I think the name of it is something like Spies in the Sky or something like that, mm -hmm. written by Dino Brugioni. Dino Brugioni was a very high-ranking uh, official in that center. He was at the group level, and when I left the CIA, I was one step below him. And during that period, I did some very exciting things. I was in the front row of history. I was making history. What could you ask for that would be better than that in a career? Is to be doing something you know how to do, that you love doing, and you know is important. And getting paid for it. Huh? <laughs> and getting paid for well, it. Well, yeah. See, <laughs> that's part of our system, you know. The money goes round and round comes out here. 
So what were you doing the day that JFK got shot? I was at work. Specifically, I don't know what I was doing. I think I was mo walking from one side of the uh, place to the other. It was still relatively empty because we hadn't hired enough people to fill this building. It's called Building 213 in southeast Washington, the crummy part of town. You didn't want to park your car out there. <laughs> well, anyhow, I got into this thing and I went from photo interpreter to section chief to branch chief and then to deputy division chief or acting deputy division chief, some damn thing like that. Anyhow, I moved up the ladder pretty rapidly. Uh, but near the end, near about 1978, things were beginning to unravel. There was talk about combining the uh, National Photographic Interpretation Center with the map makers from St. Louis, the uh, Aeronautical Chart and Information Center, and creating a homogenous uh, agency or division or whatever, what would that be? It would be an office, it would be a pretty high level thing. Yeah, they've got a building now in, I think, Springfield, Virginia that's uh, twice the size of one we occupied. It's a brand new building. Building 213 has been torn down. Well, anyhow, I was tickled to death to be doing what I was doing. It gave me the opportunity to travel. I, uh, I visited foreign countries. I visited all kinds of military facilities in the United States to better uh, improve my experience in military gear, that kind of thing. What was one of the, the most interesting pictures you had to interpret? Most interesting pictures? Yeah. The one of uh, Moscow, SA-1 Site 33A, shortly after the Russians began building the site of a anti-ballistic missile capability. And I'm the one that put the finger on what was going on there. Although, I mean, I, I thought that's what was going on, but I couldn't come right out in my report and say, this is what's going on. You see, one of the relationships that photo interpreters have with the intelligence analysts is that the intelligence analyst is the one that writes the final report, the so-called CIA report, the one that goes to the president on a daily basis. But uh, I don't know. I it was a it was a hell of a good assignment. All I got to say, uh, except it began to fall apart because of this combining of these right. two big groups. Uh, turmoil, 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 turmoil. Nothing but turmoil. And every time you turn the basket over and start from scratch, you screw things up. So things were beginning to kind of go to hell in the handbasket. And a lot of the old timers that left then and shortly thereafter were unhappy with the way things were turning out. Now, one thing about that organization is you don't, once you leave, you leave. You don't find out what's going on after you left. People don't talk. Right. And so I had only to guess because there were a lot of momentous things happening in the world in the years after I retired. And I said to myself, those people must be on that. I'm sure they're busy as hell. And I'm sure they've got a lot better material to work with than what we had. So the upshot of the whole thing is here I am at the age of 94 going on 95. 
I've Mitch. got. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I've got four children. Wonderful. They've all grown up to be first-class citizens. One is a boy. There were three girls. The boy has been working with the University of Tennessee now for about 25 plus years. He's a distinguished lecturer at the university. And I'm just as proud as punch for him. And I'm proud of all the girls, They're wonderful people. And then, then I ask those who are philosophical in their nature to contemplate one thing. And just one thing I'm going to mention is only one of many things that happened in my life that have similar connotations. When I crashed my airplane in Hungary, I picked a field, a random field, to bring it down into it, down. When I finally exited the aircraft and ran into the woods, in order to evade capture, I traveled through the woods for 15, 20 minutes. I have no idea what direction, except I was quite sure I was heading south, and I wanted to go south to get to Yugoslavia. But this is what, this is the situation, and I'm thinking that. So, it. Go ahead. I'm going to say, so Mitch, once you finally retire from CIA, yeah. um, and, and of course you, you did all your military stuff, was it hard for you to, uh, was it hard for you to get back into to being a civilian? Oh, a uh, little, a little, but actually the, the experience in the military was, was, uh, was positive. Uh, I had. I don't think it, your question implies some possible problem with a person who was a military for a long time and then becomes a civilian. And some yeah. probably do have some problems there, but not all. It's it's an individual thing. So you're okay readjusting back to? Oh civilian yeah, I, I I was I was okay. As a matter of fact, uh, the the fact that I had all this military experience was extremely beneficial in my getting this job right. with the CIA. So I ultimately retired uh, from the CIA and decided to move to Escondido, California. I had picked it by doing a lot of research, including looking at satellite photography. Uh, my next door neighbor, Mr. Willett, who was a real estate man, sold me this house. It was in 1957. In 1958, I moved out here with my daughter, my youngest daughter, uh, that was, and we've been here since then. Uh, you had mentioned before that you um, remained friends with uh, some of the people you served with. Is that is that the case? That I what? That some of the guys you served with, yeah. you remained friends after oh, yeah. retiring and right. all uh, that? Uh, eventually, they just disappear from the, from the screen, Yeah. which means they're dead, or they're like I am. I'm so disabled that I can't even write letters. My vision is going bad, see? Mm -hmm. I can't read and I can't write. I can listen, and I, I love listening to... Uh, Books that are, you know, yeah. audio books. How do you think your wartime experience affected your life? I think it was the best thing that could have happened to me. I think it was absolutely beneficial. And who knows what would have happened. The reason I began, I lost my train of thought a little while ago when I was talking to you about crashing, going through this forest, right? right. Now, keep in mind that 
the variables here. Picking a field to crash, picking a forest through which to escape, and making a conscious decision as to whether I go left or right as I plow through this forest. Keep that in mind, okay? Each thing that happened depended on the outcome of the previous thing. Right. A link, there's a link of events. And I come to the edge of this forest and I hear this noise and this wagon goes by, it's a gravel road, and after it disappears I decide to cross the road. Right. I step across the road and I step on top of two guys eating their lunch. Now, you tell me how it happened that after all that, I happened to cross that road at exactly where those two guys were eating their lunch. Right. And, but that was key to my next voyage through the world. Yeah, you told us about that. That was really yeah. a key part of it. Right. So, philosophically, looking at this thing is, you begin to wonder now, are the things that happen to you random, chance, or is there somebody at the keyboard someplace? You know, and you can go either way and make a good case for it. Because we don't know what that keyboard is connected to, we don't know how, how it's wired and how it works, but there's probably a keyboard someplace. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a man called God Yeah. Probably uh, punching those keys. We don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's very easy to dismiss uh, these kind of thoughts as uh, wishful thinking and even go back in history to try to fathom how it all began in the first place. So it had to be a need, a need for man to, to, to believe in something that's going to happen after he's dead. He, he can't quite grasp the idea that he lives for no reason at all. There had to be some impact on something. Right. And so knowing that, it makes it so much easier to pass through the eye of the needle. Right. Well, Mitch, I only have a couple more questions sure. for you. Um, first, I wanted to ask you, uh, during your military service, did you ever have any... Um, Dealings with the Red Cross? I have. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I thought they were positive. For one thing, I'd have, I'd have gotten out of prison camp a lot skinnier than I did if it hadn't been for the Red Cross. Uh, we received in, in the prison camp, and the Germans allowed it to come in, what they call Red Cross parcels. They were about the size of, uh, well, a, a box that contains eight cans of Campbell tomato soup. Yeah. And these packages came into the prison camp. They were assigned as one package per week per man. But it never, we never experienced that. We were on two men per package per week. So two men had to share a package. And in order to keep everybody happy, we, on certain prize items, we drew the cards. High card got first pick. But when you had seven packages arriving for a room, we had a room of 14 prisoners, which means every week we got seven parcels. And we had people designated as the cook, and another person as the vegetable man, blah, 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 and so on. It was really well organized. And uh, this guy would make up menus for the week with the food that was in the cupboard. Because the Germans didn't give us anything worth a damn. Yeah. So if it hadn't been for the Red Cross food, we'd have been in deep doo-doo. Did they ever come out and visit anybody in the camp? Well, I didn't see uh, one there, but I'm not saying that they didn't come. Uh, I, we did get visits from uh, gentleman who represented the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, uh, and he spent quite a bit of time going around. He was a civilian and he had a free pass, so to speak, to get around. 
were you able to send messages at all uh, from the camps? Yes, we uh, were supposedly able to communicate with our loved ones, but it was a very slow process. In my eight months of incarceration, I received one card. Yeah. And one of my cards arrived about the time I got back to the States, actually. So that, there was communication. Yeah. Now, when you were first captured, um, when you, just after you got back home, how did, did were your parents notified that you had been captured? Well, first of all, my mother and father were deceased. Oh, okay. My nearest relative was my uncle, who raised me from the age of seven to, to, until I got in the army. Uh, he was an immigrant and uh, still alive when I got back. He was notified okay. because he was my next of kin. Yeah. And that's what the military looks for. Who is your next of kin? Right. Well, the last question I have for you, Mitch, is I want to give you a chance to make a final statement for the interview. Chance for a final statement. Yeah, so it could be something we forgot to talk about or something, some outlook yeah, that you have. Well, I'll, I can do that. Uh, I can probably stumble into... Uh, areas I should not be involved in, but on the other hand, you can't help thinking about things. Uh, I like to, to, to illustrate a point, I like to ask people that I get to know a little bit, uh, if they had a chance, would they would they agree to relive any portion of their life? In other words, do something different back in the years, so and so and so on. I asked these people, would they, would they be, would they like to do that? Well, you get different answers. Yeah. But the one thing they don't, none of the people responding really zeroed in on is. The fact is, you don't know what's ahead of you. Mahatma Gandhi had a famous saying, the future depends on what we do in the present. But of course it depends on a lot of other things too. But the big point is that all these things are interconnected. That's what's staggering. You take one chink out of that chain and the whole chain crumbles. So to relive any portion of your life would be the biggest mistake you could make because it might not turn out the way you think it's good. Yep. Every little thing that happens to you affects the next thing and so on and so forth. And it's kind of difficult for my children, for example, to, to contemplate that they exist today for some stupid, simple thing that happened to me 25, 35 years ago. But essentially, if you follow the train of events, that's, there's a connection there. But the person involved is not going to be happy about that, to take and contemplate that their very existence is due to some fluky thing. Okay. And that, my thinking is that lies behind the existence of a belief in spirituality. That's what I think. That people, as they start contemplating these things, they realize they had to find some rationale for it. And so they turn to a search for an answer. And different people in different parts of the world got different answers, but they were all looking for something. And they were looking for something they didn't have an answer for. Okay. That's my thought. <laughs> okay. Well, Mitch, on behalf of the Library of Congress American Folklife Center, the Los Angeles region of the American Red Cross, again, I want to thank you for your time and service to our country, and this interview is now over.
Thank you very much.